I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm providing some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literary and cultural studies. Here I want to say some things about political conditions in the European late Middle Ages through the era of modernity and into the current stage of postmodernity. Medieval feudalism was, of course, both an economic and a political system. As a political system, feudalism vested its power in the elite class who owned the land. These feudal lords controlled fiefs or manorial estates, which had been acquired originally through brute force and conquest, and had been handed down from father to son for generations upon generations. Feudal lords granted fiefs to vassals who were then responsible for managing the land, making it productive, controlling the peasants to do the work. Here is a simplified diagram showing the different relationships among actors at different levels of the feudal political system. The peasants or serfs who worked the land were literally bound to the land. Typically, for example, a peasant could not get married without permission of his lord. And if a peasant didn't like his situation where he was, a peasant couldn't simply pick up and move to the next county. Peasants could only move from one place to another with permission of their lords. All political power was vested in this aristocracy, but vassals and peasants did have certain rights that could not be breached. For example, Vassals and peasants were obligated to follow their lords into combat. On the other hand, the aristocratic lord had a paternalistic responsibility toward all of his subjects, all of the people who inhabited his domain. If a peasant grew ill or became too old to work the land, the lord was responsible nonetheless to continue to provide shelter and sustenance for his subjects. One distinctive feature of feudalism is that the geographical unit of governance is relatively small, smaller than a typical nation-state. During the medieval era, the territories that would later comprise the European nations of England, France, Spain, etc., were governed in smaller units by regional aristocrats. There were monarchs who led regional confederations of power, but they did not have the same kind of absolute control that they would later gain during the early modern period. Having said this, I should concede that the feudal political system was more complicated and more various than I have suggested in this brief account. For example, there was a completely separate parallel governmental structure of the Catholic Church in England. And in the late Middle Ages, successful merchants and craftsmen began to gain substantial economic power and some degree of political independence in relation to the landed aristocracy. During the early modern period, some kings began to amass power at the expense of the landed aristocracy. This happened in both England and in Spain, for example, during the latter half of the 15th century. There were some particular economic developments that made this consolidation of power both possible and necessary. For example, technological advances in shipbuilding and in maritime navigation techniques made transatlantic sea voyages possible. But such expeditions required higher levels of capitalization and greater levels of bureaucratic organization than were possible for any one local aristocrat to well manage. The development of the large-scale power loom for weaving wool also led to an export wool trade from England. Lands that had been devoted to staple crop production for local consumption were diverted to pastures for the grazing of sheep. This shift in mode of agricultural production forced the migration of peasants to the towns and cities where the textile mills were being set up. Thus was begun a long process of urbanization that would progressively erode the power, economic and political, of the landed aristocracy in relation first to the monarch and then to the middle class. 
The 16th century in England also saw an unprecedented rise in literacy rates among this new urban population. Both England and Spain developed more elaborate, centralized bureaucracies necessary to support the concentrated urban populations and the infrastructure for a more extensive international commerce. Along with the decline of the traditional patterns of authority that had sustained the old feudal aristocracy, new strategies for governing the population became necessary. In addition to their use of the expanded bureaucratic apparatuses, monarchs attempted to control their populations by invoking the ideology of divine right, the idea that the king is appointed to rule by God. According to this logic, to oppose the king is to reject God's divine will. Soon enough, the ideology of divine right would begin to show cracks. In 1649, English parliamentary forces aligned with the urban merchant class defeated military forces supporting King Charles I. The king was arrested, he was charged with treason, he was tried, found guilty, and was executed. When Charles I's son, Charles II, was restored to the throne of England in 1660, it was as a constitutional monarch, with powers greatly reduced from those that his father had wielded. The constitutional monarchy would evolve into the bourgeois republic of the type that would become the typical regime of modernity. Not to mention, of course, some notable experiments in socialism and a fair share of totalitarian dictatorships. But one thing that all modern nation-states have in common is a tendency toward increased bureaucratic centralization. In postmodernity, there are some signs that this consolidation of power at the level of the nation-state has been challenged by supranational organizations and configurations of power and that we may be seeing the decline of the nation-state. Some observers now suggest that the relationship between the democratic nation-state and its citizens is disintegrating as the resources of the nation-state are harnessed increasingly toward the interests of transnational corporations and a wealthy class of elite oligarchs. In this emerging postmodern, post-national order, Resources and functions that were previously seen as governmental, such as health care, education, even military protection, are outsourced to private contractors. Finally, there is an increased role in postmodernity for supranational and quasi-governmental organizations like the United Nations, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. These organizations wield considerable power internationally, but they are not primarily accountable to the citizens of any particular country. Throughout its long trajectory of development as a political system, out of the ashes of feudalism, through modernity and into postmodernity, the nation-state has been closely associated with changes in the capitalist mode of production. In our current context of globalization, it may be that the new configuration of transnational capitalist production and consumption will require and demand new and different governmental structures. This certainly means change, both economic and political. It may or may not turn out to be revolutionary change. If you have questions or comments as you're reading about and thinking about these issues, don't hesitate to send me an email. <laughs>